Hello everyone, thank you for joining us. My name is Ty and I'll be your moderator for today's program, The Hidden Costs of Status Quo and Delaying the Decision to Find a New HCM Solution, presented by Resourceful Finance Pro and sponsored by PayPro. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat box in the control panel. If they're regarding the subject being presented, I'll add them to the queue for questions at the end. Now I'd like to introduce your speaker, Patrick Sayers. Thanks, Ty. Thanks for everyone uh, for joining. I know uh, I know you have choices uh, who you uh, who you tune into for your continuing education. So I appreciate you uh, you tuning in. Uh, yeah, as, as Ty mentioned, um, hidden costs of status quo: the price of delaying your decision to find a new HCM solution is what we're chatting about today. Um, so I want to spend just a couple of minutes, and if you see me looking over here, it's because that's my big monitor, so it's not like I'm zoning off. But um, so I, whenever I sit in on a presentation, particularly if somebody's giving me recommendations, I, I always like to understand uh, where those recommendations come from. You know, who are they? What's their background? You know, uh, why do I? Why should I listen to them? <laughs> so consider this the why should I care what Patrick has to say portion of the presentation. Um, so what Newcastle Research does in a nutshell is we, we help customers choose the best HCM solution for their needs. So we're not we're not a broker who dabbles in this. We're not something else. You know we're strictly an independent um, research and advisory shop that um, has no ties to any any particular uh, company. We're we're independent. We don't get kickbacks. Like if we if we recommend going to you know any you know HCM company X Y Z we don't we don't get any kickback from that we're independent um, so we talk to a lot you know what one half of that equation is is understanding all the players in the market right uh, so Ty and I were just chatting he just his company just just changed players and we were chatting about those I have to be familiar with all those all those players and this is a the, the set of companies that you see in front of you now that don't consider that a recommendation or a complete list. Um, it's just a sample set of like this is the this is who who we cover this is the market that we that we pay attention to. There are literally hundreds of of options out there that you can choose from, which is why there's a need for for folks like us, right? To to help kind of help people sift through that that ocean of of of, of options. Um, and we're not going to talk about the players today. We're going to talk about you know more the more the customer side, the end user side, because that's half that's the other half of the the other half of the equation. Um, is our, you know, focus on understanding the market, but we also have to understand the customer. And what I mean by customer is not just, not just the customers who work with Newcastle Research, but what I'm talking about is the customer, in, you know, in general, the folks who use this HCM software. Um, and so that's what today's discussion is, is focused on, you know, what we've learned from customers that we've worked with, but also what we've, what, we've learned from other customers, you know, outside of who we work with. Um, you know, we regularly, even if we're not working formally with a customer, I talk to customers, you know, end users of, of these software platforms all the time. Um, you know, we meet at uh, industry events, you know, we network, webinar follow-ups, uh, and I'll invite you uh, to, if we're covering a lot of ground today, um, I intentionally structure my webinars uh, to be, as useful as possible to uh, a, a variety of, of people, um, you know, particularly within within HR, but uh, you know, different hats. Um, I like to make sure that everyone leaves uh, with get, getting something. So I don't do, a, let's say, a deep dive into one specific area of you know talent management or so forth. Um, I cover a lot of ground, and so we're going to cover a lot of ground. So you might have. Uh, you might have questions, uh, and if you do have questions, please feel free to reach out. I'll have my uh, my contact information will be at the end, um, and I will I, I will add to to that in, invitation. Uh, you know what <laughs> what I get when people call me up. They're like, yeah, I was afraid. You know, I hesitated to call and take you up on your offer to chat. Uh, I didn't want to walk into a sales pitch. I, there's no way for you to know that it's not a sales pitch until you actually give me a call. You know, because everyone, even people who are gonna Give you a sales pitch. I'm going to tell you, oh, it's not a sales pitch. It really isn't. Um, you know, it's beneficial to me uh, to speak with customers all the time, right? That is the lifeblood of of our business: is understanding why customers make the decisions they do. What are they considering? Who are they considering? You know, if they're looking to leave a platform, what do they not like about that platform? 
Like what questions are they asking? Who are they looking at? All of that is super valuable to me. Um, and so if somebody wants to call, I, I make no effort to, to sell them, upsell them. I just, I, I, I look at that as a mutually beneficial call. The benefit for you obviously is if you are looking uh, and you have follow-up questions, I'm happy to help you out. Um, I'll spend an hour, obviously I'm not gonna spend 20 hours with you to, to give you free advice, but I'll spend an hour with you and point you in, in the right direction. People often ask, well, why do you, why do, you do that? Um, and the reality is if, if I help you, you know, just from a, from a business standpoint, you're going to go tell 10 of your friends, right? You're going to go to your, go to Sherm, HR tech, your local payroll conference, and you're going to run into somebody who's miserable with their platform. And you're going to say, Oh, Patrick at Newcastle research, give him a call. You know, he's really helpful. And so it's, it's a win-win. I know that's an overused term, but um, anyway, that, that's here at the end of the, uh, the sales pitch. If you have follow-up questions, I'm, I'm happy to take those, uh, happy to schedule some time. So specifically, we're going to talk about those customers, uh, the, those unhappy with their current HCM solution. Um, and you see the, I divided the, 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 the 12 people, that, the, the graphic here. That wasn't random. Um, typically, we, we, we do surveys on these webinars to just little poll questions. Uh, we're covering a lot of ground today, so I opted not to have that. But based on the thousands of people who have sat in on you know uh, webinars of mine historically this is probably what the audience looks like today you know there's more than 12 of you on the call but if we were to for every 12 people four of you are probably happy with what you're using today uh, and eight of you are probably unhappy with what you're using today now that is not a reflection of the market as a whole um, that's biased because people who tune into particularly one of my webinars because i, I typically um, the webinars are, are focused on things to consider when you're choosing or you know the ROI or you know this the, the as we're talking about today that the cost of status quo so there's obviously a bias toward people who are unhappy because that's why they're tuning in um, but that's probably what the audience looks like uh, looks like today so it's interesting you know and we don't have uh, I opted not to do the polls but they're pretty consistent so I thought it'd be interesting for you even if we don't do a poll just to understand um, of those folks who are unhappy, why are they unhappy? And this is typically what that looks like. 50% uh, of people who are unhappy are dissatisfied with, so the poll question we ask, is, you know, what's the biggest pain point from your current HCM solution? Uh, we give them some options and, and this is typically what it looks like and it's, it's pretty consistent. Um, so I'm guessing this is probably what, if you're unhappy and you're tuning in today, you're, you're probably dissatisfied with customer service and then followed by, too many systems, and then it's pretty evenly split. The remainder, you know, not easy to use, not intuitive, you know, that's the user interface, the user experience, uh, and then missing functionality, right? You know, a lot of times company, you know, signed on with, with, a, with a platform when they had 50 employees, say, and now they have 150 or 200, and they've simply outgrown it, right? You know, so scalability has become an issue. They're just missing functionality. Um, you know, Congress made some changes that, that impacted clients, you know, laws that they have to adhere to and, you know, the platform they're on just isn't keeping pace with that, that type of thing. Um, but that's typically what it, what it looks like. We'll talk a little bit, we'll touch on that, but I thought it'd be interesting for everyone to, to kind of get a feel for, okay, you know, <laughs> if you're struggling with some of these things, you're not alone, right? So what we hear, so that the topic we're going to cover today is, you know, of those, those folks that were unhappy on the last slide, um, what I see a lot is, in a, in action, right? And, and that's what we're covering today is is kind of what's the what's what's the cost of that? Um, and so what we typically hear fall falls into three camps, right? It's either you know the CFO needs to be convinced that a new ATM solution is needed. So oftentimes, most often, um, my point of contact for for conversations or for a formal engagement, if we're if we're formally helping a company, is the head of HR or director of HR, HR manager, someone within that HR organization. And oftentimes they will have an intuitive sense that something's wrong. Like this, this tool is not working like it should, we're inefficient. Um, and then they go, not always, sometimes they have a really good handle on how to articulate that and, and kind of sell that, that idea within the organization to the other folks, to the other, you know, C-suite folks that have to sign off on it. But sometimes they don't, right? You know, sometimes I work with, with smaller companies who, who haven't gone through this and, you know, they go to the CFO, it's not working. CFO says, and it's not always the CFO, president, CEO, some other, you know, you know, 
person who needs to sign off on it, often CFO. Um, okay, well, what, you know, why, why is it not working? Well, it's it's inefficient. Well, how is it inefficient? Well, we're wasting too much time. How much time? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's costing us too much. Well, how much is it costing? Right, and so it's tough to quantify sometimes. And so that's one thing we'll cover today. Um, another thing, uh, another thing that we hear is, you know, the second person here, we're not sure the best way to conduct our search. So they understand that there's a problem. They understand that the tool, the, the software platform is not working uh, as, it, as it should, not meeting their needs. Um, and they may have even gotten the rest of the C-suite to sign off on, okay, yeah, go, go do it. Like we, we're on board, we need a new system. You know, I log in every day, yeah, yeah I can see it's not working or you've convinced me it's not working. And a lot of times it, it, that's, the, that's another problem is we're just, we're lost. We're, we're not sure what to do. So I, I'm gonna give you some tips on, on what to do there as well. And often I'll call him um, intern Timmy. <laughs> so oftentimes, it, to the extent the company is unhappy with with the with the, the platform that they're using today, you, they may have just conducted a search two, three, four years ago, you know, sometime in recent recent history, and they did their search and they start to do the same thing. And that's why I call him intern Timmy, raises his hand and says, you know what, we did this exact same process three years ago like why are we why are we doing the same thing and expecting different results like let's get some help and that's that's where i get a lot of calls um and then the last one and this one's huge is i don't have time right i understand there's a problem uh, i have a general idea of, of what to do uh you know who to look at like how to conduct a search but i just don't have time to do it and and that that's that's a hard place to be and i and i do i do feel your pain i really do um because those are the people that i talk to every day right they're like i just don't have time you're overwhelmed um you're in a you're in a demanding job uh and you're using a tool that is that is not cutting it right and so it, it, you're 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 overworked <laughs> because the tool that you're using isn't isn't as efficient as it can be and now you're at ask or now you the need is for you to currently you know keep doing your job but above and beyond that go conduct a search um which is really time consuming believe me i know that's what i built a business around that i it, it is a time consuming thing um so i can't i can't solve that for you today um we can we meaning newcastle research you know I, we can save org organizations a significant amount of time by developing a short list of hcm options but that's not something i can do um particularly a one to many you know non-interactive um, webinar by all means as i said you know give me a call or send me an email set up some time i'm happy to give you an hour and i promise you i will get you going in the right direction at least eliminate some folks who don't even make sense for you to waste time with that that type of thing but we're not going to talk about that today um it's just not the format it's not the it's not the vehicle um and that's not something i can do without hearing a, a bit more about what's going on in your situation so what we are covering is the other two and i'm going to give you a framework for each. Um, there's different there's different elements within each of these conversations, and, and we could spend an hour talking about any one of those elements. So um, by design, as I said, I'm going to cover a lot of ground, and so think of this as as a framework. Um, we're going to cover the cost of delaying the decision to find a new HM solution, and I'm also going to give you some tips on on what to consider, how to do that. So let's start with the the uh, the first one. The cost of delaying a decision. So these four slides, we're gonna we're gonna go into each one of them and talk a bit. Uh, and as I said, you know, you can if if your screen's big enough, you can you can read that. Uh, payroll errors, you know, the direct and indirect cost savings. We could talk for an hour just about that. You know, so this by design, I'm I'm not expecting any of you on on the phone, uh, any any of you on the call, to be an expert in any one of these areas at the end of our hour. It's that's there's just too much to cover. Um, but what's really helpful, and and I coach a lot of um, a lot of HR folks, uh, you know, and I give them this framework and say, okay, this is this is how you might structure that conversation with the rest of the executive team to get them on board. Um, and so the the way I'm going to structure this conversation with you today is uh, some of this may be education for you, but it's also to the and to the extent that is, it is education for you in terms of the, the content, great. But if the way I'm structuring it is Here's how you can present that to your CFO. Um, so if you don't know this stuff, great, you, you learn something. And if you do know it, have an intuitive sense, 
just need to understand how to how to structure it. Um, hopefully, this will be helpful for you, for you as well. So let's take a look at the first one. So these are four areas, as I said, I'm going to cover, um, and they're direct and indirect cost savings. The first one, and this is a big one. They're all big ones, but it, payroll errors. Um, so if you work in HR, if you work in payroll, you, you know this is a this is a thing, which is a, is a surprise for, for for some people. Even even some C-suite folks um, who are not in you know who don't touch you know payroll in, in HR every day. Uh, a lot of executives think like, oh, payroll is just a, it's always a well-oiled machine. It, it, it's, there's never any mistakes. And it's just that in, you know, those of you in HR and payroll know that that's, that's unfortunately not the case. Um, erroneous deductions, you know, not tracking employee hours correctly, errors in calculating overtime, holiday pay, tax withholdings. You know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of places where errors can, can crop up. Um, so over in the blue box on the right, if an organization reduces its payroll error rate from 1.25% to 0.75%, and those aren't random numbers. Those are some like, you know, if you're doing pretty well, you're in that 0 0.7, 0 0.75. And there's a bunch of studies that, that you can go pull out and download, um, you know, to, to kind of bring to that meeting with CFO to, to verify that. Um, but the, the takeaway there is, um, if you can if you can improve that if you can reduce that error rate by a half a percent right it could eliminate twenty eight thousand dollars worth of errors annually per 100 employees and that's just based on the you know department bureau of labor uh, statistics um you know just the the most recent numbers i took them from last month december 2022 uh just taking that average weekly earnings times 50 weeks times 100 full-time employees and multiplying it by that half percent. Um, so what is that twenty-eight thousand dollars? It's not a because, and I've seen a lot of studies who who that misrepresent that as a cost savings. It's not a cost savings. You're eliminating that's the that's the that's the line item. That's the the dollar value, the worth of those errors, right? And so, you know, if you if if you take that twenty-eight thousand dollars and assume, uh, which may or may not be exactly accurate, but some of that, let's say half of that is overpayment to, to employees and some of that is underpayment to employees, right? And so somebody might look at that and say, well, that, that's a wash, <laughs> maybe, but it, it's horrible on, on both sides, right? You, you don't wanna overpay your employees, right? Because that's just lost, lost money. Um, and you don't wanna underpay pay your employees because even if the employees see that and take action and correct it and bring it to HR and say, hey, you know, you, 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 you over deducted here, you know, I worked, I worked this many hours last week and not this many hours and they fix it. It just chips away at, at morale, you know, no, you know, because employees want to come in, they want to do the work and they want to make sure that they, they want to, they want to know that the company that they're working for is, is, is paying them accurately, right? They don't want to, they don't want to have to worry about that. Um, and I tend not to use blanket statements like that, but I think that's fairly accurate. Like employees don't want to have to worry about that. Um, if you're not familiar with, and, and I and I run into I work with companies and I and I speak with companies of all sizes, right? So, you know, sub, you know, 50 employee, like very, you know, small companies with you know one person running the entire HR, you know, in payroll organization, all the way up to 20,000, you know, 50,000 plus organizations with, you know, a whole army of HR and payroll, you know, personnel. Um, and so the level of the level of sophistication, the level of knowledge within those organizations um, varies significantly, right? And so, um, and so some some folks that I talk to don't actually have a, a good handle on what their payroll error rate is, right? And so, one way to estimate, and that's the the, the bull on the bottom left, one way to estimate total error uh, payroll rate is to take the percent of payroll error where that is that is more visible, and that is typically the ones that are uh, the errors where you have shortchanged your employees because they tend to bring that to your attention. <laughs> um, if you overpay employees, some will bring that to your attention, but definitely um, any mistake that is not in favor of the employee tends to tends to come to the surface uh, more often because sometimes they'll get you know, oh I get overpaid this week. Well, I'm not gonna <laughs> I'm not gonna I'm not gonna cause a fuss about that, right? And so the the, the overpayment of employee tends to be uh, under noticed by by the company and the over the underpayment of employees tends to be noticed because it, it's brought to your attention so you have that known quantity of how much is, how, have we underpaid employees you know the mistakes and just double that and that gives you a good handle on your on your total total error rate um again we could spend we could spend quite a bit of time just just on this but that's 
that's both direct and indirect cost savings. Um, and so that that's a big one. Uh, productivity and self-service is the next one we're going to talk about. So, and this is an in indirect cost savings. This is gets to the heart of um, making both your HR and payroll team and the company as a whole uh, through self-service just more efficient, right? And so the approach here, and again, this is, we could spend some time on this. I'm not expecting you to be an expert on this. These four slides are just to provide you a framework to, to approach that. If you have an intuitive sense that you know our, our our platform is not is not performing as it should be. Uh, how do I how do I quantify that? Right. So this is this is step two in that. Um, a, a good way to frame the conversation again. Um, so calculating that ROI involves determining how long specific tasks currently take. You know what percentage of the task is currently automated. What percentage is, uh, is predicted to be automated with with technology improvement. Um, and then the self service aspect. So that's just making things. Um, that's the that's the software taking uh, taking more of the, the the heavy load off of the human. Um, the self service is that plus also allowing um, allowing somebody who's clocking in clocking out, for example, somebody not working in HR payroll, allowing them to use self service, taking that taking that load off of HR uh, in, in payroll's head. Um, and so there are a number of studies out there, and there are a number of uh, like Ernst and Young did a study calculating. You know, if if Bob on the front lines, you know, in, in a retail establishment calls Betty, you know, in HR or payroll, or you know, Sally calls John in HR or payroll and says, "Hey, can you help me fix my vacation time?" You know, this this doesn't seem right. Um, it costs the company X, right? But if they can, if that person on the front line, if that person clocking in, clocking out, they, that that doesn't work in HR or payroll, if they can do it themselves, it costs the company Y, right? And that's typically lower. And so. Those are the kind of, and that just takes estimating. And I'll give you kind of a um, an intuitive example of what I'm talking about. And it was actually a real world example. I was talking. I was I, this was a company I was working formerly with, and um, I was working primarily with the with the head of HR. And we got on with the CFO because the CFO had some um, had some concerns. She didn't think anything was broken. Um, and I said, well, let's let's have a let's have a conference call. Uh, you know, and until so we the three of us got on and. So we got in and we started talking about it and the CFO and she's doing her job, right? You know, she was, uh, she was saying, you know, in my eyes on costs, you know, I don't want to go and spend thousands of dollars on a new platform if we don't need it. Right. And so she started saying, well, we do that today. Like, this is how we do that today. And that's free because we use Excel. And I said, okay. I, I said, well, you know, I was very polite, but I, I said, well, okay, but let's examine that, that word free. Right. So how are you doing? That? So basically she was saying, we have a workaround. For that and it's Excel and we you already pay for Excel, you know Microsoft Excel. Microsoft Excel is great. I use it for a lot of such stuff. Um, and I said, well, 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 how long does it take you to do that? Like, you know, what? How much are you using Excel to do that work around every week? She's like, 15 minutes. I said, okay. I said, well, you're the you're the CFO. I said, you're spending 15 minutes a week. How much is your team spending? Um, and she said, well, it's because she had a team of three or four people in there. And she said, yeah, they, yeah, they're probably spending more time than me. And so all in, like her team is probably spending a couple hours a week. And then I shifted over to the head of HR, and I said, "How much is your, how much is your team?" And at that point, the, I could see the light bulb starting to come on for the CFO, you know, because the, the HR team and the payroll team they were doing the same thing, uh, and they were spending you know more than a couple hours. But I said, "All right, so let's round down and conservatively call that four hours a week that everyone's spending doing this." I said. And she finished my sentence for me. She's like, that's not free. I said, that's not free, right? <laughs> and so that's intuitively what I'm talking about is quantifying that. So you're not just walking into a meeting saying, oh, it's not efficient. Well, what does that mean? Well, you know, how, how much is that costing us? Like how many hours? Um, so that's that's the second second part of the approach. And not necessarily in order. This is this is ne not necessarily two, number two of four. You can pick and choose whatever, you know, whatever one you want to do. Um, the third one I want to talk about is, Technology consolidation, and this is this is a pretty straightforward one. Um, and if you're using a bunch of systems today, the CFO probably already has uh, has a pretty good understanding of, of of what they're paying out. But basically, it's taking how many systems because sometimes they look at a system and they say, "Well, okay, well, we already have a bunch of systems that do that. We already use this for this. We already use this for this." Or they just look at the new system that you're proposing, and, and that's like, "Well, that's really expensive." Um, often. It will be less expensive uh, for that one system that does a bunch of different things than to use, you know, ten disparate systems, 
right? And so how many systems is, is payroll? I, I, I talked with a client not too long ago, national restaurant chain. Um, I, I won't mention their name, uh, but they're a mess behind the scenes. And I'm not, I'm not picking on them. I, you know, the person I'm, I'm talking with, uh, would, would she would be the first to concede that they are a mess behind the scenes. That they're using like ten different systems, and it's even worse because they have uh, <laughs> it's ten different systems, and the, the they're owned by three different organizations, like payroll and HR own some. IT, you know, falls under their budget for a couple of them, and then talent management owns it. So it's they they have a a ton of different systems and I, and so we did a rough back in the envelope calculation and i said if you just moved everything to one system you know rather than paying all these different ones um because it's still expensive like you might you might for example have let's say uh let's say you have a standalone time to attendance and sometimes there's, there's sometimes there's a need for it i'm not i'm not i'm not suggesting that there's never a need to have disparate systems um, you might need the feature functionality that that one standalone system has, you know, because you have some unique circumstances. Um, if you don't, you might be paying, I don't know, $10 per employee per month for, for, for that, you know, and it might be $5 per employee per month as a module within a larger system. So if you add up, you know, all of the costs associated with all the different systems you're using, and you compare that um, to that one system that you're contemplating moving to, it will often be lower, right? And so that's a pretty direct one, um, and that's a pretty pretty straightforward one. Um, and any kind of hard savings, uh, hard cost savings, uh, you know, direct cost savings, that's gonna that's gonna appeal to any any CFO out there. Um, and then the last one I want to talk about is is potential cost savings, and that's compliance risk. Uh, and this I could have touched on, you know, in in the first one with payroll errors uh, as an indirect cost savings, um, but it's it's big and scary enough that it that it's worth talking about as a standalone topic, and that's um, the potential for for fines. Right, you know, there are there are billions, billions of dollars of, of fines levied every year because of companies not paying their employees correctly, not withholding correctly, um, and that's a tough thing to to quantify, uh, you know. But just the specter of that, I have seen, I have seen. Uh, this sometimes is 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 the the one that 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 convinces the 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 rest of the C suite that okay, yeah, we don't want any part of that. Like we don't want we don't want that unknown. Um, and so that's that's a huge one. Um, just the potential uh, to avoid those, those fines and levies uh, because of incorrect uh, incorrect payroll. So normally I would ask if there are any questions. Uh, if you have if you do have any questions along the way, just um, just send them off to Ty, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, and again, I know I'm covering a lot of ground, uh, so you you may have questions. Um, but yeah, so reach out. And I, I apologize, I don't know the, the, the vehicle um, that, that Ty used to do that, but I think there's a way for you to, to email or, or, or text real time, and, and I'll try to cover those in, in the Q&A. Um, and if you don't, if we don't have time, if you have other questions, if you want to dive into any of these areas in, uh, in more detail, uh, absolutely set up some time. I'm happy, I'm happy to, to walk you through that. So the second topic um, that we have time to cover today is, you know, what to consider when you're searching for a new HCM solution. And so I'm going to give you a framework, just like, um, just like quantifying that cost, just like the last 10 minutes. I'm going to give you a framework for these as well. And I'll say the same thing again. It, you know, we can talk about any one of these uh, in greater detail. I want to cover a lot of ground. I want to give. I want to make sure that everyone leaves with some some nugget, hopefully more than one nugget of information. Um, so these are just five questions to ask when you're when you're looking. So it kind of gives you a, a way to frame that uh, a way to frame that search because I will tell you a lot of times what happens is you're unhappy you know not you like the general you like a team is not not happy and so they just start calling you know they oh well, my friend you know at some other company uses them and they like them a lot so I'll call them and that's fine like you know talk to a lot but there are literally hundreds of options out there. So what you you can't talk to all of them, right? Well, if you if you can, you have more time than I do. Um, you know, given that given that your your primary job is to is to use this <laughs> software, not search. Um, but so this is this is so often what happens is is they'll just start calling people, uh, even if they have a, a kind of a, a structured framework of questions. Uh, oftentimes, that goes out the window once once they start seeing demos, they fall in love. So it's always good to have a framework to to refer back to. Like what 
what are, what are the important questions that I need to be asking? And so these are five of those. If you, I promise you, if, if you're looking today, use this as a framework. Uh, if you are not looking today, you know, I think you have access to this presentation. If, if you need access, you know, send me an email, I will send you the presentation. Just tuck it away in some folder. And, you know, if you're ever in a situation where you, you, you need to search for a human capital management new software platform, pull it out. I promise you, if you, if you ask these five questions and refer back to them throughout your process, you will significantly increase your chance of success. And, and, and again, this is what, this is what, this is what I do for, for a living. And, and I'm not smarter than anyone on the phone. It's just where I sit in the process. I see, I see a lot of unhappy customers, right? Because typically, and I'm happy to talk to happy customers, by the way, if somebody wants to call me and chat and tell me how much they love the platform they're using, great, I'm, I'm happy to have that conversation. But typically the people who come across my desk, the people who, who, who interact with me, it's because they need help, right? It's because they want to chat. And so I have a lot of conversations, hundreds of conversations throughout the year with people who are unhappy with their solution. And so I will ask and say, well, when did that, you know, in order for me to help them, I need to understand like, why are they unhappy, right? Um, so I'll ask questions. When did, when did it go wrong? Like, what, what are you unhappy with? Is it service? Is it missing functionality, blah, blah, blah. And so often, you know, if, if you have enough of those conversations, you, you start to see patterns, right? You start to see patterns of, it's not necessarily who people pick in terms of why are they happy today, it's the questions they asked along the way. And if you have enough of these conversations, you start to notice that the, the, the folks who are happy asked a lot of the same questions. You know, they didn't necessarily end up with the same, the same human capital management vendor, right? Because it's, it's not a one size fits all situation, right? And I use car analogies a lot. And Ty and I were, were talking about this, you know, before the call. If you have, and that's actually a great segue to the first slide, the right vehicle. Um, if you have like a, a Jeep Wrangler might be, I think this is a Range Rover on, on the slide here. If you're going camping every weekend, that's a great vehicle for you, right? You know, but if you're commuting 200 miles a day, that's not the right vehicle for you, right? It gets terrible gas mileage. The, the, the road, the highway noise is, 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 is gonna be so loud. You're, you're not gonna be able to listen to the radio or take a call, you know what I mean? So it's, but, Every single one of these HCM vendors out there, they have happy customers or they wouldn't be in business. But every one of them has has customers who have left them and have, have unhappy customers. So it's it's not just about finding there is no one magic unicorn, you know. Um you, know, you have to ask the right questions. So anyway, long story short, you start to notice patterns and you start to notice um that happy customers, customers who are happy with their HR, you know, HRIS, HCM solution. Um, tend to ask a lot of the same questions. And these are five of those questions. So what's the right technology vehicle? And what I mean by vehicle, this is the first one, um, the first of the five. I just took a quick look at the time, make sure we're on track. Um, what I mean by vehicle is, is human capital management, a PEO, if you're familiar with that, professional toy organization, HRO, which is, you know, outsourcing. So actually some of like the person on the front lines I mentioned, you know, a retail establishment or the person on the manufacturing floor, if they have a problem, they're calling and they're getting an outsourced, you know, third party. So they're, they're calling. So that's an outsourced situation. There are hybrid situations. That's what I mean by vehicle. For for most of you on the phone, on the call today, I'm assuming that is going to be a, a probably cloud-based solution that your internal team uses. And so that's what most of the remaining tips are, are um, are going to assume and go, are going to address. But it's always worth taking a look and taking a step back because I, I, I can't tell you how many times I've had this conversation where somebody called and says, yeah, we're, we're feeling pretty good about our search. We just we just wanted some, you know, just wanted to run a couple things by you and, and, and see, what, see what your thoughts are. And I'm like, yeah, great, happy to have that conversation. And they're like, all right, well, we've narrowed it down to these three. And, and sometimes those three are three completely different things, right? So one of them is, an outsourced solution. One of them is, you know, a SaaS, you know, cloud-based SaaS solution um, that their team is using. And one of them is a PEO. And I'm like, well, those are three entirely different paths for your organization, right? So a PEO is 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 great in certain cir circumstances, but given the rate at which your your company is growing, you're, you're probably going to outgrow that model in you know in a year, right? And so, and I know PEO organizations that I know and trust 
who won't even sell to employees above a certain size because they know it's not the right model, right? And so that's not just me saying PEO it, it doesn't work over a certain over a certain size. So anyway, long story short, it, the best approach is is to decide on a type of vehicle uh, that meets your needs and then evaluate options within that category. Because if you're if you get to the end of your search uh, or toward the end of your search, if you've narrowed it down to three, four, four different you know options and they're completely different types of vehicle then the search didn't reflect your needs and the, the car you know we have a I think that's a tesla a ducati and a range rover they're all great vehicles right but they're designed to do very different things right and so if your final choice of a vehicle is between these three then something has gone awry with your search right so something your search didn't accurately reflect your vehicle needs and so that's what i'm talking about with the with the human capital management search so is the solution a single HCM or integrated? Um, and this one is in, in particular, we could spend a lot of time on. Um, so, and there are different definitions depending on who you talk to, right? And so my definition, which is in line with 80% of the market is a single HCM is, is built from the ground up on a single code base, right? So it's one employee record, uh, architecturally, if you if you if you ever get into the weeds with you know um, architecture, it's it's a it's a single database solution, right? An integrated HCM is applications could be HR payroll over here, time and attendance over here, talent management suite, you know, onboarding, you know, recruiting, onboarding, performance management, succession planning, learning management, compensation management. There might be a few different you know options within there. So there, in an integrated HCM, human capital management suite is one where the applications were developed and built separately and then brought together, right? And so modules may be on multiple databases, disparate user interfaces, and sometimes sometimes just because they're owned by the same company doesn't mean that they all of a sudden magically become a single HCM. And what I mean by that is a lot of there's a lot of companies out there who have grown through acquisition, right? And that's not a bad model to grow by, right? And so they might historically have been a payroll company and then they have expanded their HR and then gee you know our customers are, are really have a need for actually let's take the COVID situation right so a lot of customers all of a sudden you know needed a remote you know an ability to train employees remotely so they needed a learning management system right and so a lot of the the HR payroll companies we're scrambling to, to they oh we don't have that it's on a roadmap for but let's partner near term or if they're big enough, let's go buy this company, right? And so, so just because they own it, just because they may have acquired it, doesn't mean it's not still on a separate database, right? You know, so it, it, just because it's, and I always caution companies because they're like, oh, we're just using, and they name a company, and they're like, so it has to be single. And no, no. <laughs> and I could point out, like, and, and a good telltale sign is. Um, like you know, if they're using the the standard platform, and I always kind of give people tips. Well, actually, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so, but why does it why does it matter, right? So, a single HCM, you know, there's no there's no need to manually update data into separate systems. Um, it just requires it requires you know you to enter it in once, um, and so that reduces time um, spent. You know, updating it reduces errors. You know, if you don't have to manually update in separate systems, and that's a, a huge complaint I hear. If you remember the poll um, that I shared with you from, from past webinars, um, the number two complaint is is too many systems. And and one of the big one of the big you know kind of symptoms of that is that these these modules don't talk to each other, right? You know, I do something over here and it doesn't reflect it over in payroll, um, so I have to go in and port it, put it in Excel, and I have to you know so people are jumping through hoops just to make the different modules within their system talk to each other. Um, Again, we can talk about this at length. I mean, there are there are security uh, problems, you know, having having multiple systems. <clears throat> if it's if it's a third party partnering, um, sometimes that third party will make an update and it will disrupt the uh, your user experience, you know, and and then the company that you are you're working with, the human capital management company, the platform that you are using, they have to scramble to to then adjust to that. Um, so there's a there's a whole host of uh, reasons why that single HCM is better, um, and I, yeah, I touch more on, on here. But so uh, the question I often get is, well, how how can I tell, <laughs> right? Because oftentimes I wish every salesperson out there 
And generally speaking, I think the, 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 the people selling these systems are good. They're good people, they're knowledgeable people, uh, they're gonna treat you right. But sometimes you will get somebody who either doesn't know uh, or tries to kind of pull one over on you. You'll ask like, oh, is this a single HCM? And they'll say, oh, it's absolutely integrated. You, you think they answered your question in the affirmative, but they, they actually did, right? And so you really have to, you know, dive deeper. And I've had, um, I had a recent, uh, it was somebody who, who joined the webinar, I think it was last summer, and we had a follow-up conversation and I just gave her some tips. And I said, well, here's what to look for. Um, you know, if, if you're going through the demo, um, you know, and you see the, the kind of the core platform, the core landing space for, for that for that software, and you click on HR and it does this, and you click on payroll and it does this, you click on, you know, recruiting and it does this, and you click on time and attendance and all of a sudden a new window pops up. So it behaves differently in some way. That's a telltale sign that that's probably on a separate database. But I also coach her on kind of what questions to ask, like about multi-database. And she's, she called me back a few weeks later and she said, oh my God, like the, 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 the demeanor, the tone, the vibe of the room immediately changed when I started asking questions about, about databases and architecture. Um, and she said it was all of a sudden they realized, oh, okay, she, she, knows, she knows what she's talking about. We can't. And so she said she just felt like they were much more transparent, much more honest with her after that. Um, so I can give you some tips on that. Um, but that's, a, that's another one, the single HCM versus integrated. And I always talk to, to customers about this, customers that, that we work with formerly, but also people I just have conversations with. It's a matrix of decisions, right? Uh, of factors that you have to consider. There, and I mentioned it earlier in the presentation, uh, there is no one magic unicorn, right? You know, everyone wants, everyone wants the same thing, right? They want the best software. They want the most updated, keeping pace with all the compliance changes. They want the best user interface. They want it to be slick. They want it to be intuitive. They want the best price, right? They want the best customer service, right? They want to be able to have concierge level service, right? Well, guess what? If you have all those things, it's going to be the most expensive thing out there, right? You know, you know. So there is no something's got to give, right? And so, um, so it's a matrix of decisions. But what I will tell people is, this is a really, really big one. That that single database, it's it's pretty close. So there are no must-haves, right? Because you have to you have to consider everything. It's like car shopping. Um, and I use this example a lot. I live in New England. It snows a lot here. Um, do I need all-wheel all -wheel drive? No. I have owned cars that that are not all-wheel drive. There are many cars out there on the road that are not all-wheel drive. But all-wheel drive is pretty close to a must-have for me, right? You know, because of I've lived here my whole life, I know how important that is. How how much safer that makes me and my family as we drive around. So that's that's a good example. That's pretty, it's not technically a must have, but it's pretty close to a must have. That single HCM, uh, that architecture is pretty close to a must have for me when I'm advising customers. Um, a lot of times, you know, in that, in that the first stage of the conversation when people want to ask them, oh, what's going on? Uh, you know, what's, why are you unhappy? Some customer service is a perfect example of that, you know, because half the time, it's actually a little more than half, but you know, dissatisfaction with customer service is is by far the number one thing that people complain about. Sometimes it's because of just surface level, they're just they're just bad at customer service. But sometimes it's it's a symptom of something else, right? And I'll give you an example, tying back to this architecture. I'll, I'll dig a little deeper, and they'll say, "Yeah, well, it's actually funny because it, customer service is really good when we call and ask about payroll, but when we call and ask about time and attendance or workforce management." It's not good. Like it's just it's it's like night and day. We talk to a different group. Their their the turnover is higher. They just don't seem to know what they're talking about. And then I explain to them, well, it's, I see they're partnering <laughs> for time and attendance, and, and they weren't aware of that, right? And so you know they they don't have the in-house knowledge for that module because they, it's not their in-house module, or maybe they just acquired it last year, right? And so this this seamless single HCM, this unified single single code base, single database architecture has a ripple effect across your, your experience of, of, of that software, uh, including, including customer service. And it makes sense, right? If they have one, if your customer service rep has one module, one, one platform that they need to become an expert in, that's easier than becoming an expert in 10, right? And so, so it, it has a ripple effect. And I wanna move on because I wanna keep an eye on the time. Um, reselling situations, good or bad? 
Um, so I will tell you two situations you want to avoid. Uh, and so the short answer is uh, it depends, right? And so the situation number one that you want to avoid in a reselling situation, just just to just for definition, um, is when you contract with you you uh, sign up with you know HCM provider X Y Z, and they might partner with with someone else, and so they're reselling a third party solution. Um, Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. Um, so situation number one that you want to avoid, you buy a solution from a single provider, assume it's a single system. We covered a little bit of this in the last slide. The reality of the core component is delivered through third party. Uh, the results, you know, disconnected workflows, customer experience um, is, is poor, you know, because the support for one module isn't as good as the others. I already covered a, a couple of these details in the past slide. Uh, so that's something you want to avoid. And that that is a, I, I am wary of situations where uh, an HCM provider is is partnering because, by definition, you know that's on a single uh, on a separate database, or you know you're you're getting into bed with a multi database solution, right? And there are inherent problems with that. Um, and as we said, ripple effect, customer service, user experience, there's a whole host of host of things that it that impacts. And so. I have some customers tell me, well, okay, that's great. That's good education. I've learned from that. That explains why I'm so unhappy with the, with the, the system that we're using today. I'm just never going to go through any more resellers. That's also not the way to go, <laughs> right? Because the situation that number two that you want to avoid is, you know, and I hear this all the time, why would I buy from a reseller when I can buy directly from a software developer? Okay, that kind of makes sense, but you don't want to eliminate uh, options that might be your best might be your best option and what I mean by that th there are certain situations and this might come as a surprise to so some, some of you on the call there are certain situations where I will recommend a reseller over the the original software developer you know because that reseller might have better customer service for example they might know your specific industry they might be in your geography there's a whole host of reasons but at a high level the the situations that that give me pause, that make that they're a, not a red flag, but a little of a caution flag, are the ones where they're selling one piece, you know, to complement what they're doing. It could be a stopgap, like they might be developing their their own solution, and they just need a a stopgap until that happens, um, which is terrible for you, the the client, because then 18 months from now, you're you're going to have your employees learning an entire new system, and you're the guinea pigs because they just rolled it out. Um, the ones that I don't, that are not a red flag, are it, the ones where a reseller is selling an entire solution. So they've made the decision that we're going to, we're going to couple this technology with our industry expertise, you know, customer service, whatever it may be. Um, and as I said, there are there are situations where I will recommend a reseller uh, over. The, the original manufacturer or you know developer of the product because they have better they have better customer service so and as as I said it's sometimes it's it's difficult to to understand what what you're buying um, and I wish there I wish there was an easy way for you to do that without again I don't I, at the risk of sounding um, like a, like a commercial it, it's going to be it's going to be tough for 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 customers to um, to deduce what they're looking at sometimes without somebody like me in their corner, um, because they will tell you, uh, they're, oh yeah, no, this is our product. This is, a, you know, it's it's completely integrated. No need to worry. And sometimes the sales rep doesn't know, right? They've been fed, you know, information from their marketing team. Just tell them this. They just regurgitate it. Um, you can do do some to the extent they're publicly traded. Um, you can go out on uh, the Securities Exchange Commission. You can look at their 10K. You can read through that. And you can sometimes glean, you know, if they're using third parties, although companies go to great lengths to hide it, even within those, they, for example, many of them will vaguely reference a third use of a third party on page 83 of 200, and they won't even mention them by name. Um, so it's, it's tough, but, but, um, but do your best to try to figure out what, what you're buying and, um, you know, give me, <laughs> give me a call. Uh, implementation plan. I'm just keeping it out of time. Um, confusion around implementation is a recipe for disaster. And so the the cautionary tale that I want that I always want to tell people is, and again, this 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 goes back to if you're in pain and you're using a system that you're that you're that you know is inefficient, searching for a system is taking you 
outside of your work. You, you're 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 paid to use the system, not to not to look for a system. And so oftentimes, the department that I'm working with, the person that I'm working with, will get to the decision, um, and they'll say, and then think their job is done. Your job is only half done. You you have to pick the right solution, but you also have to get that solution set up correctly, and that requires work on the customer side and on the vendor side. And so I always like to set expectations with customers, the, you know, the end users, the customers I'm either formally working with or speaking with, networking with, with just, just having a, a brief conversation with, to understand that it's a two-step process. Um, and the time to start thinking about that implementation is during your evaluation of the vendors, not after you've signed them the dotted line, right? So what to look for and ask about this, right? The vendor should have a detailed plan. They should be very transparent about what um, what to expect during that implementation. They should be able to tell you what resources you're going to need to commit in terms of time, staff, what's their responsibility, what is the customer's responsibility. If you get any, any inkling that, that they, don't, uh, they don't have a really rock solid plan and they're not being transparent with you, that's a red flag, right? So often, and some vendors are better about this than others, but often you'll hear some form of, oh, don't worry, we do this all the time. We'll figure it out when we get there. No, you want you want detailed, <laughs> a detailed plan. Um, sometimes it, the implementation will be done through a third party and the customer will, doesn't even know that until after they sign, right? And so get all those questions answered, get all those details. Because um, what I will tell you, every conversation that I have, um, you know, I always ask, you know, why are you unhappy? You know, oftentimes, because that helps me figure out, okay, what, you know, what's gone wrong? Like, how can I help them? Like, what are you looking for? That helps me understand, you know, kind of just the context, what's important to them. But it's amazing how often that relationship with that vendor went south before they were even up and running, before they were even live. It's amazing how often, I don't know what the number is, but I would say, you know, probably 50% of the time, their unhappiness with the with the solution they're using started to go south. That start that relationship started to go sideways during the implementation. That's when things started to go bad, even before they were even live, before they were even up and running. Um, and so it's super super important. Um, okay, last one. And we're cutting it right up close. I'm not really leaving a lot of time for Q and A. I apologize for that. Um, Customer service, right? And I've mentioned this before. It's it's the number one reason why people leave. It's um, you know the the polls the polls I do on these webinars uh, suggest 50%. I would say it's probably even a little bit higher than that. Um, but it's it's interesting because even though people know customer service is is paramount, it might be the reason why they're leaving. Um, oftentimes, it's not it's not a critical component in their search, right? And the reason for that, I, and I've had a million conversations around this, um, and I joke with customers sometimes because it's it's like, well, when we talked two weeks ago, you said you were leaving because of customer service, and I'm looking at your must-haves and nice-to-haves, and I joke with them, and I'm like, where is customer service? And there's just crickets. And I quickly let them off the hook because it's it, it is it's a difficult thing to quantify. It is right. It's easier to quantify easy to quantify price, right? Well, sometimes it's easy. Sometimes they try to <laughs> vendors try to hide. You know things you know in between the cracks but generally speaking it's easy to, to, to quantify price it's like okay this one cost x this one cost y uh, it's even somewhat easy to to quantify functionality right it's like can you do it or not like you know can you check this box can you not check this box it's a little more difficult than price because they can check it you know to varying degrees sometimes but customer service i, I promise you every vendor that you sit down with are going to tell you that customer service is their number one priority right and so how do you how do you measure that um, so here's a, here's a quick and easy way to measure that because everyone will, they might even put a CSAT metric in front of you, customer service and CSAT metrics, net promoter score, you know, all these metrics that fall under customer satisfaction. Um, they're good. I'm not suggesting you ignore them, but I always, I, I always coach customers that I'm, that I'm talking with, uh, you know, you know, working with, what does that number really mean? So they might put a number in front of you that says 95% customer satisfaction. It's like, okay, well, so you, you surveyed your customers and 95% of them are satisfied. Well, how many people filled out that survey? If they're lucky, maybe 40%, right? You know, 20% is probably industry average. So what that tells me is, is okay, 95% of 40% of your customer base really likes you. 
all right, well, what about the other 60% that didn't fill out the survey? How do they feel? <laughs> I will tell you because I work at a research, a research company that is that that the folks who didn't fill out the survey, there's a bias toward being less happy, right? And so what I always encourage people to look at is customer retention, revenue retention, um, because that encompasses their entire in their entire workforce and basically it's 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 fairly intuitive right it's people vote with their dollars like if they continue to stay with you year in and year out it's because they like you um and i use car examples a lot you know because people can relate to that it, you know if your neighbor across the street is on their fourth toyota camry or your other neighbor down the road is on their fourth you know chevy silverado or ford f-150 whatever it is you don't need to ask them if they like those vehicles they keep buying them like they demonstrate that they like them with continued voting with their dollar and so that's what that revenue retention is um and oftentimes just some quick definitions you might ask for customer retention uh, and and the company might give you revenue retention that's fine technically they're different um if you have 10 companies at the beginning of the year 10 customers and one of them leaves uh, you know, so at the end of the year, you might have added a few more new customers, but those are disregarded for the sake of the calculation. But of those 10, maybe say nine of them are still there. So that's 90% customer retention. But if that one that left was really big and accounted for 50% of your revenue, even though you have 90% customer retention, you only have 50% revenue retention. That's some just quick and dirty math for you. Um, the reason you don't shouldn't bat an eye if they give you revenue retention if you ask for customer retention is um, because as these companies grow and they have hundreds, thousands of customers, those two numbers start to look a lot alike. So they're not exactly synonymous, but but they're they're, they're pretty cool. Um, probably I would say two thirds of the companies out there will will share that metric with you, revenue retention. Um, not all do, and some of the big ones don't. Um, if they don't share it with you. That's a huge red flag for me, and I've told those companies this directly. Um, give me a call, and I'll tell you which ones those are. Uh, basically, they're saying th this thing that that we wake up because whether you're Netflix selling movies or human capital management se selling, you know, a recurring software as a service, like their mission in life is to keep you as a customer. Uh, not a lot of people know this, and and customers, but they're actually not. These companies aren't. They're not most of them aren't making money on you until year two, sometimes year three, right? And so you'll pay an implementation fee, but that will only partially offset the cost it takes to get you up and running. And so they need to keep you <laughs> as a customer. That's what they do in and out. That's that's what keeps them up at night is how do we keep customers? So if they're not willing to tell you how good they are at keeping customers, like the thing that that's their core competency, that's a huge red flag. Most will in this space, that stoplight is a good rule of thumb. If they're below 90%, you know, customer retention, revenue retention, red flag, ask more questions. Sometimes there's a reason for that. If their if their customer base is really really small, um, sometimes that is adversely impacted because a lot of those companies are smaller companies. Uh, they go out of business, and so their retention rate is adversely impacted by that. So sometimes there's a reason, but definitely start to ask questions. Average in the space is somewhere in that 90 to 94% range uh, in terms of retention. Anything above 94%, 94, 95% that is rare air that is that is you don't get to that by accident uh, so there's a think of it like a bell curve most are most are in that 90 94 percent range um the really really good ones are up in that 94 plus all right that's i have left zero time for questions but uh ty you can let me know if we have time for and i'm willing to stay on if if if, if anyone else is but but definitely get my email address is there if you have any follow-up questions let me know but ty do we have uh, time for one or two yeah, absolutely. In order to remain on schedule, we'll uh, get to two questions that came in via chat, and then we'll respond to the overflow uh, via email in a timely okay. manner. Yeah, so, any question that comes in, I'll, I'll definitely respond to. Uh, but yeah, yep. what do we got, Tuck? Yep. So our first question is, what are the pros and cons of going with a smaller HCM vendor versus one of the larger market share leaders? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, that's yeah, it's involved. It depends on who who the small player is and who the big player is. But generally speaking, um, generally speaking, some of the smaller vendors uh, will often give better customer service uh, because they're they're smaller, they're more nimble. Um, some of the larger players, once you get up into five, ten, twenty, sixty thousand employees, that's a pretty unwieldy organization. And, and although they're trying very hard, sometimes customer service can can suffer. Uh, not always. There are some very large companies who have great customer service, but 
generally speaking, smaller companies tend to have better customer service. Larger companies uh, tend to, to to struggle with that a little bit sometimes, not always. Um, but that's a, the, it, but the uh, the inverse of that is the larger companies have a lot of R and D dollars to spend, whereas a smaller company might not. Uh, and so keep, we mentioned throughout the organization or throughout the presentation, keeping pace with those regulatory changes, keeping pace with just the demands of the market in terms of what they're expecting, what end users are expecting in terms of features and functionality. Like if you have a lot of money, if you're big and you have a lot of kind of economies of scale, right? If you have a lot of money in your R&D budget, you can keep pace with those. Um, there is a best of both worlds. You, you can, you know, and I mentioned this, there are, there are certain uh, circumstances where you can have a smaller company really committed to customer service, really nimble, who might be reselling a larger company's software. Uh, so there are situations where you can get the best of both worlds, but that's at a high level, that's how I would answer that question. Good question. Thank you, Patrick. And we will get to one more and then uh, I'll, you can keep the mic for closing remarks and then I will uh, conclude our program. Uh, awesome. Why should we consider company culture when considering an HCM vendor? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's a question that comes up um, more and more. Uh, and I'm happy to see that it does. Um, so the, the, sh the short answer is, well, there's a, there's a, it's a multi, it's a good question. It's a multifaceted uh, question. Um, the example I give when, when it comes up is, oftentimes like if, if, they're, if they're treating their employees co correctly, meaning they mean the end, the HCM vendor, it tends to mean they they uh, they they treat their customers better. And the example I'll give is if you fly into a city, you're at a business conference, you've never been to the city, and and you you, you don't know any of the restaurants. And the only thing that you know is that a restaurant on your left, they treat their employees really well. The employees are really happy. They they have very low turnover. Um, people like to work there. And the the, the restaurant choice on your right, you know those employees are miserable, right? They're high turnover, they don't like to go to work. Where are you going to go? Based on no if you have no other information, which which restaurant are you going to choose to go to? You're going to go, you're going to go where they're happy, right? <laughs> right? Because you want people preparing your food and serving your food to be happy. You want them to, you know, like to work there. Because chances are you're going to get better food, you're going to get better service. It's the same thing with 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 these companies, right? If if the folks building the software, servicing the software, you know, answering the, the phones when, when you have a question, helping you get you set up correctly. If they're happy, if they, they like to go to work, if their culture is such that they value people, um, you're probably gonna have a better experience. Um, and so I think a lot, of, a lot of customers are figuring that out because uh, I'm getting that question more and more. And I'm, I'm happy, I've written about this in the past. <laughs> Uh, and so it's a great question. I'm, I'm not surprised it came up because it's it's one that I'm getting more and more. So, and yeah, Ty, I'm, I'm, I'm all set for closing remarks. I really appreciate everyone tuning in. Uh, as I said, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to have the conversation. Thank you much, Patrick, as always. Greatly appreciate all your great guidance and info that you share with us. And again, in order to remain on schedule, we'll respond to the overflow of questions via email in a timely manner. So with that, on behalf of Resourceful Finance Pro, I would also like to thank everyone for attending. This concludes our program. Thanks, Pat. Thanks.